All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope your break, your lunch uh, was excellent. I'm excited to kick off the afternoon uh, session with, uh, our, in, in some ways, maybe, maybe second only to the digital divide, probably the, the, the most important topic that we could be talking about when it comes to urban technology, which is about privacy in the public realm. And we're going to do this afternoon's conversation on this topic in two parts um, because uh, one of our panelists had to be, had to be remote. Um, and so I'm pleased to introduce Albert Fox Kahn, who's the founder and, and executive director of STOP, um, which has been a, a fast-growing leading voice on the topic of, of privacy and surveillance. Uh, he, based here in New York, but its, it's thinking is, is beyond New York, and, and Albert's been a, uh, a real help in the research we've been doing, um, and, uh, and I've learned a ton from talking with him, and, and, and I'm sure you all will as well. So welcome, Albert. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person. Uh, no problem. Uh, we're happy to accommodate, although we miss you. Um, let me start out you know, with, with kind of a, a broad question, um, which is about privacy, right? You know, you hear some people say, hey, wait a minute, what is this thing about privacy? I'm a law-abiding citizen. I don't have anything to hide. Why should I be concerned about privacy? What do you say to that? Well, when I look at the harms that come from data collection, when I look at the harms that come from surveillance, I don't think of it in terms of privacy. I think of it in terms of power and in terms of state violence. And when we look at some of the abuses that can come in the public sector from police abuse of um, facial recognition, drones, predictive policing, a lot of the times it's not this sort of abstract privacy cost that people are most concerned about. It's how does it replicate and augment the sorts of abuses that we've seen through for so many generations in New York policing and policing across the country. How do we see systems like predictive policing automating the inequity and discrimination that, that so often targets police violence at BIPOC communities? And, and so I do think that it really is something far more expansive than just the, the type of harms that people think of when they use the term privacy. That's interesting. Let me build on that because you know, one of the things in, in uh, before lunch, we were talking with uh, Myrta Santana from, uh, from Riseboro, and she was talking about the different levels of openness to data sharing among city agencies. Uh, among the clients she deals with, underprivileged, and and I didn't push her on it, but I I think you know one of the things that probably changes people's perspective on privacy is their history of interaction with p the police and with the state in general. How how do you see that playing out? Is it is it kind of a one for one correlation? Is it kind of the old old thing about you know a, a liberal as a conservative who's been uh, arrested or something like that? How how do you see that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the cost that these systems have is very different for someone like me, a uh, you know, privileged white man versus, you know, a client of mine, for, you know, someone who may be undocumented, who may have an experience of being targeted by the police. And oftentimes the exact same data can have very different impacts depending on the entity that's using it. You can have location data that's tracked by, you know, the Department of Transportation that will feel very innocuous when it's just looking at how to collect tolling data, uh, how to collect tolls. But when that exact same data is now used by the NYPD to track uh, people's locations around protests, it becomes very chilling. And when you think about the capacity for ICE and other federal agencies to use that exact same data, we can see that the same technical systems used by the same entity can have vastly different impacts depending on the end user of that data set. Let me build on that, because I think that's one of the questions that you, know, you and I have discussed on occasion and, and we really try to wrestle with in this report, which is that I'm, I'm a bit of a tech optimist. I think there's a huge opportunity for technology. I'm, I'm an optimist about government. I think government, and particularly municipal government, is good and, and can be made better um, and should be made better. And yet, oftentimes, that does lead us to collect more data, um, which, as you rightly point out, especially if misused, can, can have a downside. How would you think about balancing the upside 
from a better informed government or, or a government that can collect data versus the downside. How do we draw the line? How do we make the trade-offs? How do we build in the protections that allow us to have the benefits but while avoiding the risks? Well, there are a few different components that come into evaluating the data life cycle of a lot of these different systems. First of it, first of all, you have privacy by design principles that you know are going to adjust the scope of what data we collect up front. Oftentimes we'll see vendors and agencies that have a very optimistic perspective on how data can be leveraged, who will assume that collecting more data is good when even if you don't know how that data will be used simply because it creates more potential in the future to then build off of that system. But I take the opposite view that you should only collect that data where you actually have the use case clearly defined where you know how it's going to be used and you know that the benefits are proportional to the cause. The second part is creating what I call legal firewalls. You know, our legal system builds in this default assumption that any data that's collected either by a company or by a city agency is essentially a policing tool in waiting. That's just one court order away or just one information sharing agreement away from being handed over to the police. And, and so what we're trying to do is reverse that dynamic and say that we need clear limitations that's, that for some of these data sets, they can never be used by police. And, and there are examples of that being deployed elsewhere in the world quite successfully to give us the benefits of the, some of these technologies without the risk of co-option. One of the distinctions that you just cited and, and one that, that you helped educate me and the team on is the distinction between the court order or warrant and the information sharing agreement. And one of the things we talk about in, in the draft report is, is the fact that in many cases, data collected by one New York City agency is effectively available to the NYPD or, in fact, outside of city government at the discretion of the commissioner. And so if DOT is collecting data on speed cameras, which I think are wonderful, it also is just one phone call away from being handed over to the NYPD, assuming that the DOT commissioner is agreeable, but since the DOT commissioner works for the same person that the police commissioner works for, presumably, you know, that'll, that'll happen. Could you talk about that distinction and how successful, because of course, we talk in our, our draft report about the idea of imposing a warrant requirement on interagency transfers to law enforcement agencies. And there's a model in Massachusetts that I know you're well aware of that, that perhaps you could talk about. Can you talk about warrants as a protection? Why do they fall short? How good are they? Um, and whether that Massachusetts example is one New York should follow? Yeah, so I, I think that warrants can be a step in the right direction. What we see today is oftentimes wholesale data transfers from one city agency to another, with the NYPD being the prime beneficiary. And when you look at you know, the real-time crime center, when you look at a lot of the systems we've set up to aggregate vast storehouses of information in the names of policing and without any evidence that actually helps promote public safety, it, it's a real cautionary tale, especially given the political dynamics in the city where the NYPD often wields outsized political power, making it much harder for agency heads to refuse their request to, to share information. And, and with the warrant requirement, you then can require individualized showing that the information being sought is relevant to a specific case. But what we've seen in the United States is this exponential growth in the number of warrants that are being issued. It's easier than ever to get these warrants issued. And you see new types of warrants that are being issued, uh, so-called geofence warrants, which require the production of all information related to a specific neighborhood or a specific uh, city. And these can be used to get tens of thousands of people's records at once. And, and so, you know, as someone who comes to this from an activist background, who comes to this as a surveillance abolitionist, you know, I, I am very much focused on, yes, embracing warrant protections where they are an incremental uh, safeguard, but oftentimes going further and saying that with a lot of these technologies, 
we simply should not be allowing the police to access this data at all. And unless we have that baseline protection to begin with, we simply should not be installing these uh, sorts of systems in our neighborhoods. Are there precedents for other categories or classifications of data that are, are just even a warrant can't get law enforcement access to them? Yeah, I think the best example is the U.S. Census. So during World War II, we had a horrific example where we saw the you know, FBI and other federal agencies, the military using census data to target Americans of Japanese descent, you know, imprisoning them it, simply for their ancestry. And in the aftermath of that horrific abuse, we, we saw Congress respond by implementing criminal sanctions, a, an actual criminal penalty for any use of census data other than for the account and apportionment itself. And so today, it doesn't matter what crime you're investigating, it doesn't matter what case you're working on, you do not get to access census data as part of your investigation. That is a clear bright line rule without any exceptions whatsoever. And with a lot of the types of information gathering we're, we're you know, contemplating now for smart cities, it's even more invasive potentially than the sort of data that's collected through the census. And if we want to have that type of data being collected by city agencies but, you know, for these other public benefits, we should follow that census model and have a clear prohibition on any use by uh, police. That's interesting. It does, the, the concern about, about police power, of course, uh, you know, probably resonated with a, a lot of New Yorkers last summer. Um, but now, especially with this, with this election where we saw Eric Adams talking about public safety is more of the problem than police power. You said a moment ago, uh, or, or alluded to the fact that the, the surveillance and the data doesn't actually necessarily lead to greater public safety in your mind. How do you think about that? Where does surveillance maybe appear to lead to better safety, but, but it doesn't? And, and what would you recommend to the New Yorker out there who's concerned about the safety of the streets and, and is wondering why would you take stuff away from the cops now when, when we need safety more than ever? Yeah, I think the best analogies here are inherently analog. They're looking at the decades of wrongful convictions that came from use of bite mark evidence, hair sample evidence, fiber analysis. These were used for decades by the FBI, by city and state law enforcement to try to put people in prison. They actually led to numerous convictions, even executions in high profile murder cases for a type of forensic science, which is now roundly debunked. And what I think we're going to see increasingly with a lot of these technologies is the realization is even though they're dressed up in the language of science, they are not scientific investigative techniques. They are pseudoscience. Take, for example, facial recognition, where we're running tens of thousands of searches in New York City. And we're not just using you know, technology which is biased and error prone, as has been shown by NIST, as has been shown by a number of in independent researchers. We're allowing officers to go in and Photoshop images before submitting them for facial recognition analysis. We're having officers go in and, and you know, where part of the face is obscured, they'll go on to Google, look up a, you know, a similar looking uh, model and cut a portion of that fa uh, facial image put that collage together and run it through the analysis. And so what we have is something that is introducing a huge amount of uncertainty, a huge amount of error risk, and a huge potential for abuse into our criminal justice system. And we're paying millions for it. And it seems to me that this is a clear win-win where we can you know, stop spending money on you know, technology that really has not been proven to be effective, which has been proven to be error prone, which has been proven to be biased and can protect against the sort of privacy invasions that come when we give you know, police the, uh, a technology which can potentially track large numbers of people at protests, at, uh, you know, at mosques, at churches, at other sensitive sites. Let me change gears, and, and, and my final question to you is, is, we've talked about the city gathering data, we've talked about, about the police. How should we think about the private collection of data in our public spaces? 
the store or the apartment building that has the CCTV aimed at the sidewalk, the, the private entity that might say, hey, let me sniff uh, MAC addresses as they walk by just to get a sense of how many people are walking by my store. How, how should we think about that? This is something that needs to change. This is an outdated notion that somehow if you collect this data in public that those of us who are walking the city don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. It's wrong because while we may not expect that walking around the city, our face will be hidden, that we people can't see us walking by, that's very different from having the ability to track us almost continuously based off of our electronic devices, based off of biometric data. And, and it creates this really chilling capacity. I, the cities were once valued in part because of your ability to find anonymity, uh, to you know, wander unimpeded by the sense that everything you would do would be tracked in the way that small towns uh, um, might be. This uh, You read about 19th century writing uh, on the joys of wandering the city and you find countless examples of this. And, and I am just thinking, I would hate for New York to become a place where none of us can walk out our door, can walk down our street, can enter a store without second guessing how everything we do will be watched, will be tracked, and will be judged by the algorithms. Interesting, excellent. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry you couldn't be here to, to be part of the conversation with, with our, the rest of the panel, but I continue to be grateful for what you've shared with us both today and, and throughout this process of, of the Rebooting NYC report. And, Thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. Thank you again for having me. Excellent. And now I'd like to welcome up to the stage uh, our two panelists, um, Tara Pham, the CEO of Numina, and, and I'll be asking her to say a bit about her company uh, in a moment. And of course, the Honorable Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. Um, Former council member and council member elect. Congratulations, uh, council member elect. Um, so thank you both for, for being with us this afternoon and, and to, uh, to continue our conversation about this important topic. Um, and, and let me start with you, Gail, if, if you don't oh, mind. Oh, no. <laughs> um, you know, in, in your time in the city council and as, as borough president, um, you've been an advocate for, for municipal technology. Um, you know, long before it was a hot topic, you were, you were thinking and talking about this. And, you know, in, in the conversation with Albert, of course, there are limits. Um, but how do you see, as an elected official, the upside? What's the benefit of the kind of technology that might be gathering information in the public realm? Well, I did pass, as you know, the open data bill. And that platform, I remember during the Bloomberg administration, what was ironic about it was the agencies were more excited than the public. Because the agencies, um, as you know, one agency didn't know what another's database was. So that, I think, has been helpful um, in terms of we do need to have agencies that are not silos. And so one of the ways to do that is to know um, what is being collected. Um, we've been able, in our office, at the Borough President's Office with Beta NYC, which is a nonprofit, to take some of this open data, which is probably academics can use it, real estate people can use it, but we want the community boards to use it. So we've been able to work to show them how to go about peeling back the onion so that if you're working in the streets, or you're working with bus lanes or bike lanes, or trying to figure out what the housing evictions are, we hopefully will have that. So we can say in Hamilton Heights, we've got a whole bunch of evictions come January 15th, and we want to send housing organizers in there so nobody gets evicted. That's where I think it becomes helpful. You know, so you know how many we were able to, for instance, how many faith-based institutions are not landmarked in the borough of Manhattan. And then if you're Gail Brewer, you go, please, please, we don't want developers to tear them down. So that's the way it's helpful, that kind of data. And of course, you can't do it unless you have, in my case, uh, with the community, um, some civic engagement to help you figure it out. So that's where it's helpful. That's different, perhaps, than um, I think we're more focused today on this privacy. Albert was great. 
with the police data, for instance, it took us a long time because the communities, we have the seven basic police data, which we all know, the big ones, the assaults and the robberies and so on. But what the community wants to know, actually, I don't even know if that's available yet, we've been trying, is you know how many summonses for the young people in our area. Because then we want to be able to say we want to have some outreach so these young people do not get caught up with summonses or how many people are jumping the turnstile at our area. Maybe that means that they have um, no money to buy or maybe it is that they need some support so they don't do it, et cetera. So there's a lot of issues about the level of data and then of course how real it is, real time, that's another whole topic. So I think collecting data that is helpful to support uh, community planning, which is basically what we try to use it for, is helpful. Excellent, thank you. And Tara, let me ask you, you've, you've started a company that collects data in the public realm. And could you talk a little bit about, about what you do, about the problem that it solves and the technology you use? Yeah, um, and thanks for having me on this panel. It's very exciting. Um, so my name is Tara Pham. I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called Numina. And we make a sensor that mounts to fixed infrastructure in streets. Usually that's light poles, can be buildings. Uh, and our sensor measures how all types of different objects and travelers use the street. So to an urban planner, uh, they may be familiar with this lingo. We detect the desire lines, uh, essentially the actual paths traveled of pedestrians and bicyclists and cars, buses, trucks. Uh, in Midtown, we measure bags of trash. Uh, and we're able to do this with our sensor because it is camera-based. So we're a computer vision company. Uh, computer vision is essentially AI applied to imagery. Um, where we are unique from, say, a surveillance system or a traffic camera is our sensor uses imagery to detect what kinds of things are in the street, does that analysis, onboard the device, and then discards the imagery, and we never collect any personally identifiable information. So anything that could be you know, an individual's information is just never saved in the first place, and we're only sending this anonymous category-level data back to our servers and the cloud where we do other analysis to turn this information into analytics that are useful for urban planners primarily, mostly planners focused on walkable and bikeable uh, cities and, and planning initiatives. Um, and so uh, most of our use cases are in planning, um, traffic safety. Uh, one reason we focus on bicycles and pedestrians is you have a lot of ways to count cars. And so in a lot of cities, all of their planning is around cars. Uh, and what we're trying to do is actually make the data that accounts for everyone else more accessible, uh, but to do so in a very privacy-conscious way. I just want to say, I know that you're asking the question, but I just want to say <laughs> public realms are, um, this is so perfect because there are 25 city and state agencies working in your area, and I don't think they coordinate, so congratulations. I can 25. verify I don't think they coordinate. <laughs> Well, and I will say I've, I've been uh, a longtime fan of your company just because I know when I joined city government in 2006, I was shocked at the fact that nobody can answer the question, has pedestrian traffic gone up or down on a given block? Right? It, yeah, and it's also, you know, as New Yorkers, I think we're used to understanding everyone in New York uses streets, you know, on foot or or something equivalent. You know, most people don't own cars, and New York is unique in the US in that way. But actually, you know, we, we still lack a lot of that basic bike ped data. So um, yeah, we're super excited to be working in that space here. And let me ask you to say more about kind of the, what you described as the privacy protecting feature, which, uh, you know, I think, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but basically is an example of what Albert mentioned as privacy by design, right? Exactly. Incorporating privacy into the very concept of a technology product. Can you talk about how you came to that and how you did it and what you would say to the person who says, you know, it's still a camera. I'm not sure I trust them. They're still taking my picture. Yeah, so um, when my co-founder Martin and I started working on this company was in 2014 and the headlines were largely about, you know, Edward Snowden's leaks and PRISM and it, it was a topic of interest to us because as a company that collects data in the public realm, it made it, um, we couldn't feign ignorance about the risks of collecting personally identifiable information. And so we designed from the beginning 
protections uh, such that we're never collecting that PII. Um, and, and we focus on that in the public realm because uh, when you are a Facebook user, whether or not you read it, you signed a user agreement that allowed them to use your data. When you walk in the street, you don't ever opt in um, or opt out. And so we, in working in the public realm and working with cities uh, as some of our customers, uh, it, we have the utmost responsibility to respect people's privacy. Um, and uh, one of the biggest components of privacy by design, at least in, in our approach to it, uh, is data minimization. So we don't over collect data. We only collect what is sort of like the minimally viable amount of data to serve our use case, which in traffic planning means, you know, we are never saying there's Joe Smith. We're saying that was a pedestrian shaped blob walking at this place. And then we also aggregate the data at such levels uh, that would prevent re-identifiability. So one of the other kind of moving targets in technology and with AI is for better or worse, you need less data to make inferences. Um, and so even data sets like ours, if combined, you know, at our highest granularity combined with other data sets like cell phone data, you actually could make our data re-identifiable. And so we actually take additional uh, protections in how we aggregate the data, publish it, um, and also just in our um, user agreements and policies, none of our users should be using the data for re-identifying individuals. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Gail, and, and you know, Tara, you, you raised this point about the difference between what you do on your phone versus what you do in public and the level of consent. One of, the, one of the distinctions that we draw in the report is between, and this is hardly innovative, you know, they're not claiming authorship of this, but the distinction between consumer privacy, where, again, whether it's fair, whether you've paid attention to it or not, there's some sort of personal agreement that I downloaded this app and therefore I have a personal relationship with this entity or this company versus I'm walking down my block and I have no choice but to walk down my block. And so public realm privacy and consumer privacy are different. And we posit in the report that consumer privacy is something that really needs to be done at the state and national level. But in fact, the municipal level is the right place to regulate public realm privacy because it's part of the street environment and traditionally municipalities regulate the street. Does that resonate with you as, a, as an elected official and a uh, once and future legislator? It, it certainly does. I will say though, just in thinking about this topic today more than I had in the past, that every time you turn around with the public safety issue, which is quite hot right now, the police departments are asking elected officials, NYCHA's asking elected officials to spend your money, public money on cameras. And it's a, it's a constant. So, you know, the local commanding officer will say, I need a camera, you know, at 126 in uh, Amsterdam. Otherwise I can't take care of uh, the people you want me to take care of. So, and then of course, they'll also say just the other day, I know we had a huge, uh, individuals opening doors at all the fast food restaurants on a strip. They make a hundred dollars a day, just what the going rate. And so how do you deal with that? Well, we want McDonald's and Popeye's and everybody else to put out more cameras and monitors. So you, you have this pressure from the public of some realm to have more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So um, while we're sitting here and Albert was correct, not wanting PD to stereotype, because that's what you can do with data, certain people, people of color in particular, men of color in particular, then, um, you know, it's, it's a real challenge. And I think this kind of discussion is needed because we're sitting here with the pressure of more cameras, more monitors, et cetera. It's not clear where it's going to go, and it's often in the streets. There's no question. It's not in, I mean, I feel very strongly about not having facial recognition to get into people's homes. I've had to undo it in several situations, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, so th it's a really good topic and needs a lot of discussion. Can I Please? add to that, respond? Um, so one, I think what's, a, what's a, an important distinction to us at Numina is that um, we don't do anything with enforcement. 
We do collect data that is used for planning and operational purposes, but not for enforcement. Um, and if you're just talking about planning and operations, there is zero need to have any personally identifiable information. And that's something kind of cool that we heard from our customers over time was like, oh yeah, all that PII is actually a huge risk. We don't want to deal with it. Um, it's, it's great that we have our own shareable, safe, privacy first data set um, and our own, I'm saying like DOTs and planning departments. Um, enforcement also does not correlate with public safety. It correlates with, you know, detection of, of safety issues. Um, and I, th I think there is a little bit of um, a misunderstanding, like so many companies right now are getting out of the facial recognition game and that should tell you that companies led by market-driven decision-making do not want that risk themselves. Facebook is closing down and deleting all of their face, uh, facial recognition data. IBM and Microsoft have both gotten out of that game, have said they're not going to get into it. Um, these are major big tech who have essentially said, facial recognition is so scary, we don't want to be responsible for it. So I think that should tell folks in the public sector how dangerous this over data collection can be, this overreaching data collection can be, and facial recognition is something that really compounds biases, we know that. Uh, and so as much as we can avoid facial recognition, I think that's critical. It's not something that Numina does, this is just me kind of right. going on a side personal rant. And, and, and I think, you know, I, I think there's, there's widespread understanding that facial recognition adds so many components to this, but but it isn't just that, right? Because you could also track people by capturing license plates and, and all sorts of other ways. Um, and, you know, the famous example of, you know, figuring out Kevin Bacon's taxi trips, uh, you know, years ago, which taught all of us, and particularly TLC, about re-identification. Um, but, but Gail, I'd, I'd love to build on, on what you were just saying and thinking about some of what Albert was saying around the pressure for the police. And one of the contexts or one of the ideas or concepts that we talk about in the report is by Cornell professor Helen Nissenbaum, who has the concept of contextual integrity. And basically it's in a nutshell, it's the idea that there's kind of a culturally understood use case for certain kinds of data, right? You walk by a CCTV camera, they're usually not very well hidden in many cases. And you kind of understand, well, okay, you know, if a crime happens here, they're going to go back and look at the tapes. And I accept that, you know, maybe I'll get questioned if, if that's fine. You aren't expecting that because you walked by this camera, you're now going to be in some database and forever they're going to know that you were here at that time. And it's kind of like what you were saying, where if the precinct captain says, hey, I want a camera on your block so I know when something bad happens and I can respond quickly, Everybody's like, well, of course, that makes a ton of sense. But as Albert points out, if that then means there's, that's contributing to some massive surveillance system, that changes the rule. The problem is, how do we make sure that the police or anybody else uses the data the way they say they're going to use it and not in these other ways? And, and so how do you think about that as somebody who's going to go back into the city council and have that oversight role? I have problems with all this right now as borough president. But um, a couple of things. First of all, when he talked about this, I was laughing when he talked about this sort of too many warrants pop up when, because that doesn't work in government. And I think you know that. In other words, if you were to say there's a firewall between, um, you know, getting the information and using it in a way that's too broad, we just have to go get a warrant. I was laughing because as an example, we hate, well, I should say I hate, um, construction every weekend. Uh, you're supposed to only have construction on the weekends and the evenings when you have a, you know, some kind of a large uh, device coming in or something, you know. Um, but now everybody can get, every single weekend seems to get an, a, a weekend permit to do construction in the neighborhoods. So the same thing would happen with the warrant. It just becomes the cost of doing business. And, you know, you try to stop it, but once the uh, train goes down, um, it's really hard to get rid of it. So the same thing with the warrants. So I just want to say that government doesn't operate with, okay, we're always going to make sure that this is taken care of. It, it just doesn't work like that. So I would say, to answer your question, the notion of um, making sure, for instance, I know people are upset now because there is like a gang database, right? 
Well, who's to say, how in the world do you know who's in a gang and who's not, right? You, you are just adding names for people who might be, as you suggest, walking by the developments or walking by the store. So, you know, this issue you have to have. I don't, I don't think I know the answer to your question. I think that's why I have, we have to keep discussing it. Um, there isn't, there's some legislation that I know Lori Cumbo and others have tried to promote that would try to come up with some criteria. But right now, um, it, it, we're in the same situation. If you go to any of the developments at NYCHA, residents are dying for more cameras. They beg me for more cameras because the notion is you'll catch people um, when they're doing bad things. But you also could find out that you have a database of people who are just going to work and who maybe look like somebody that is committing a crime. So there, this is a, a not a defined, not the policy isn't correct, and I don't think we figured it out. I will tell you that the cops tell me that if I steal something in Manhattan and I go to Florida, they can catch me on every single ca camera between now and Florida. So that's what they told me the other day. So that's the kind of cameras that already exist. And the question is, who else are they catching and what kind of database are they using it for? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's the level at which we are surveyed today. Interesting. And Tara, oh, and, and by the way, we're going to turn to audience questions in just a minute. So get your, your thoughts together. My, my last question for, for you. In the report, kind of in the same way we think about government surveillance, we also have this idea of requiring any cameras that are in, in the public realm to disclose what they're what they're working on and, and actually building on a, a concept of d uh, data transparency in the public realm that, that came out of Sidewalk Labs but is now an independent nonprofit. Um, do you think a requirement like that would be helpful? It, would it be onerous? Would it be difficult for your cameras to comply with? So not ours. We were actually kind of one of the initial uh, products and sensors piloted with DTPR, the Digital Transparency in the Public Realm program that Rit just described. It's a set, it's an open source now set of signage and communication protocols that tell pe people as they walk past, you know, here's a device collecting data, here's what it collects and why. Um, I love that. One, because we were designed to protect privacy and I want people to know how much work we put into making that possible. Um, I actually don't envy other companies that did not develop with that, uh, those principles in mind and have to retrofit because it's actually very difficult. Um, so for us, it's not difficult to, to comply, but um, I, I do wanna say, I think it's incredibly important. And I also think more municipalities should require that um, and also embrace companies to do that messaging themselves. I just wanna give a small example. We work with a city that actually pioneered their own stops uh, secret surveillance ordinance. Um, but when we put up our devices, they said they, that we couldn't have our logos on the device. There are reasons they have that regulation. I get they don't want companies advertising, you know, in the public realm. Uh, however, as a company, we do so much to message what we do, why, and that is unique to our product, Numina. Uh, and so for us to remove the logo, and also we often get requests to make our sensors more inconspicuous, it defeats the whole purpose. We really push on our customers to actually make our sensors as conspicuous as possible and message what the data is being used for because citizens, I think we need to give citizens more credit to understanding how these technologies work, why they're being implemented and the risks and benefits and you know that trade off. Um, and citizens should get to decide what goes in the public realm and if that data collection is worth it for them based on the benefits. I just want to add one thing to the question that you answered, which is, and this is hard, how do you um, find out what trans, what, how do you make the NYPD or another agency transparent enough so that they give you an idea as to before they use it for a data sharing operation? Because, mm -hmm. and I've, you know, that's hard. Just getting the agencies to be transparent at all is hard. And then getting them to do it in a public sort of open source way is hard. So these are the challenges that I think we've not been able to uh, address in a comprehensive way. Excellent, thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience here on, um, for, for Gail or Tara? No? 
Clayton, please. <laughs> You're going to get a mic here. Oh, thank you. So I guess, I mean, this is such a, I don't know. I, are, we, are we talking enough to just regular citizens on the issue of privacy and confidentiality? I'm curious about that because it's, it seems to be a very corporate driven thing, driven thing right now. And then the honorable and one of the greatest people I ever known in my please, life, please, please, give me a Brewer. break. <laughs> Gail Brewer, give it I'm, up for Gail no, please, Brewer. Please, my please, God. please, please, please. I know him very well. Stop. Listen, I shifted my time here just to be here. <laughs> please, Clayton. But she has to deal with all of the public, you know, herself as along with her colleagues. So I'm just, it's a question for both of you, but perhaps you go first as to. Uh, at the end of the day, is this something we think uh, is sustainable 20, 30 years from now? Because 20, 30 years ago doesn't seem like it wasn't that bad. So I'm curious what and is by the big difference. What is sustainable, this level of yeah, data collection? Yeah, especially and the, the sensors and all the things that you're talking about. Yeah, so um, I'll say environmentally and economically, I think this sort of data collection, the onus is on the companies and the vendors to prove that they are sustainable. Um, our hope, we are specifically mission driven to help communities become more walkable and bikeable. One, because our planet requires it. Uh, and two, because it actually for cities is, is much lower cost to build and maintain uh, non-motorized uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, so you know, we think that we are sustainable uh, for lots of reasons. Um, in terms of the community engagement piece that you brought up, I think cities and companies are not doing enough. Um, one way that we at Numina kind of uh, deal with this is we always work with local partners. So uh, one thing about every technology company that we should all be aware of is when you build a technology product, it is designed to be one size fits all. It is designed to be rinse and repeat scalable. That means it is inherently not built for your community. And so, you know, we recognize that there's a limit to what we can do. Uh, and then we always work with community partners because locals are the expert in their own places. Um, and so that's how we kind of make sure there's a community voice and representation in the work that we're doing in the community. Um, but, you know, different companies may have different approaches to that, may not do it at all. And I think that's where the, the owner should actually be on the local government who's the customer to say, hey, as our vendor, you need to be doing that community engagement or you need to work with us to do that community engagement so people understand what data we're collecting, why, how, and so on. Excellent. Thank you. The only thing I would add in uh, thinking about it now is how could we as citizens and community board members figure out this use that does do environmentally or economic development planning that would help the stores and help the communities in different ways. Because we do hear about these cameras and these surveillances as you know police related, which is the wrong message. So the question would be picking up on what you said. Okay, so uh, these cameras could also be used and they're not now to figure out who's walking up and down the streets without any personal information and how else we could get customers for these stores or for this uh, community. That is the way that we're not thinking. And, and again, these cameras belong to everybody and their brother, sister, father, mother. You, don't, you know, sometimes I know the police, if there are, are there any cameras there? That's the kind of conversation I get all the time. So then I have to run around and see who's got cameras in the neighborhood. The bodega, oh, they have one? Oh, let's go find them. On a, on a per capita basis, we have the same number of cameras as China. Um, it's just the perception of like China as a more surveillance state versus in the U.S. It's because we have so many personally owned cameras. Fascinating. Excellent. Well, we are out of time. And so I'm sorry we can't get to all the questions. But um, I want to thank you, um, Tara and Gail. Thank you so much for such a great conversation on such an important topic. And I really appreciate your being here this afternoon. Um, thank you. A round thank of you. Applause. And now I'm actually very happy to turn over this mic.